Hi, everybody. Welcome. This is the last and final installment in our Punching Marshmallows Rage, Uncertainty, and Fatigue series of artist talks. I want to thank you all for being here tonight. And my name is Jessica Waybright. I'm one of the co owners of Remark Print Workshop here in Albuquerque. And hope you're um, all doing well out there in this wor wild world and having a good Friday. Um, we're going to uh, get started actually right now. Are you ready, Fuma? <laughs> oh. yeah. right, take it away. All right. Hi, everybody. Um, Hi. <laughs> I'm Fuma <laughs> Markowitz, and I'd really like to thank you all for joining me. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit uh, about my artist practice and my work. Uh, here you can see. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm talking to you. Oh, oh, I was muted then unmuted. Okay, um, I'm talking to you from my home and my home studio here in Western Connecticut, which is a small town about an hour outside of New York City. Uh, I've lived here with my family since 2003 uh, when we moved from Brooklyn. Uh, basically, we were moving here to get out of the city after 9-11, believe it or not. We just got spooked and it took us a few years and uh, we landed in Connecticut. Um, so here we are in the midst of yet another crisis and this time, you know, being here in this kind of semi-rural exurbia kind of space there's really nowhere to run so for me I, I i feel kind of lucky that i have my family around me still and um even with all of the tension and craziness that you can feel everywhere you go um somehow uh, i've been able to find sanctuary and solace and cope a little bit better and find comfort by engaging with my art practice. So I think we could start, Jessica, you can show actually slide two, because slide one was just my own little welcome kind of thing. Okay, so um, to start, here's the work that I was so thrilled to have included in the current show um, at the gallery at Lamarck, um, Punching Marshmallows, Rage, Uncertainty, and Fatigue. What a name. I think that's a really great name. And it's having its final day today as I'm talking to you. It's going to come down over the weekend. But uh, insofar as my practice is concerned, this is part of a growing series uh, that I'm working on using a historical photographic process um, called the cyanotype. And I've been working on these um, pieces since the beginning of the pandemic. Actually, I started a little bit before, but I really kind of reached a stride during these pandemic times. Uh, it's kind of a radical departure from much of my previous work, and we'll get to that, but first I'll give you a little background about myself and where I've come from and how I arrived at this current um, practice that I'm engaged with. So let's go to the next slide. Um, I've always been fascinated by what my childhood self called the olden days. Uh, I was totally spellbound by lots and lots of faded sepia portraits of family members, some that I knew, some that I never knew, some that I still don't know who they are, um, and, and hearing my parents' stories about how uh, they escaped pogroms and poverty. Um, that way I acquired an acute sensitivity to human suffering alongside a deep awareness of the way that time works to both elucidate and obscure human experience. Uh, photography as a so-called time-based art 
became the perfect medium for me to create my own visual interpretation of time. My father put a Kodak Brownie camera in my hands when I was seven and I was hooked forever. Um, what you see here, this is actually a picture of my first camera that is here on my windowsill, this Brownie Hawkeye camera. Um, and, you know, I've never forgotten my origins as um, being somebody, you know, using film and whatnot, but today I'm very far away from that. Um, but my photography still, it always practices, uh, it always functions as a, vis a visual diary. I make photographic images just about every day if I can. Uh, and my work brings focus to things that other people often overlook, but are significant or troubling or actually quite wonderful to me. Uh, some of the themes that I've been engaged with are my own family's life, my womanhood, uh, urban and natural environments, and that's where I've most lately drawn inspiration for making images in the nat natural environment. So I think we can go to the next slide. So here's one of those photographs that so captured my imagination as a child. This is a photo of my mother's family about two years after they immigrated from a tiny village in the Ukraine called Ananya. And they started a new life in Montreal, Quebec in Canada. My mom is the littlest girl on the right that you can see the pom-pom on her hat and the fur around her cuffs. Um, and then her older sister, my aunt, is to the left, and my grandmother and my grandfather. We could go to the next slide. And this is a photo of my dad's family taken around the same time. So these grandparents actually had been in the U.S. for about 15 years by this date. And all of the children, my father included, had been born here in the U.S. My dad is the eight-year-old kid looking like he is, you know, hamming it for the camera on the right-hand side with the long tie and the knickers. I'm showing you these photos because they're really the story of my life and they're the core of my essential self. All that I know and all that I don't know, what has fueled a lifetime of curiosity and my impulse to, cur to create. These photos are the reason why I fell in love with photography and storytelling as a very young girl and why I've never stopped making pictures and talking about them. Okay, next slide. So my photographic practice is a bit schizophrenic. Uh, on one hand, I obsessively take photos and you know, there's parens around the word take. Uh, especially when I travel, I just want to hold on to everything, to what I'm seeing, what I'm observing in real time. And I'm a hoarder. I want to save everything, you know, forever and for later. So the representative documentary and traditional four square captured image is a way of doing just that. And it partially answers my persistent question. What was life like? in the olden days, and it puts it into a framework of the present. What is life like? Again, for me, this most often gets expressed in terms of my family's Jewish experience. So when I travel, I'm interested in visiting Jewish communities and learning about how present day communities continue despite or even because of what has happened in the past and to understand the implications for me as an American Jew in a time that is much more unstable for my community than we American Jews could ever imagine. During a trip to Eastern Europe in 2016, for some reason, I just could not bring myself to photograph any people. I couldn't bear to look them in the eyes. Instead, it was the synagogues that captured my eyes and my heart. Before World War II, there were thousands of them in the big cities and smaller ones and in the mainly Jewish small towns called the shtetls. 
There were magnificently appointed structures designed by the best architects of their day and more humble and simple houses of prayer functioning as the center of Jewish life in these places for centuries. All of this came to an end on the night of November 9th, 1938, the night of the broken glass or crystal knot, when these synagogues were in so many communities burned to the ground or damaged beyond repair. And we know what happened to the Jewish communities that had once flourished within them. For the most part, they vanished and their fate was sealed by purposeful and systematic annihilation. When I returned to the US, I wanted to tell not only the story of the people, because there are others more qualified and academically certified to do that. But with my eyes and camera as witness, I chose to tell the story of the synagogues. I designed and self-published a book, my first, in order to do that. And in the process, I learned what a wonderful platform a book can be for showcasing my photographs and combining them with meaningful words. And how the process of curating and editing my images and placing them in a series with text and positioning them on a page and then a page and then a page creates a new piece of finished work that I'd not previously considered as a, a viable platform for sharing my work. Okay, we can go to the next slide. So likewise, when I traveled to Morocco this past January, I documented synagogues and dormant Jewish quarters, including the silent cemetery. By the end of World War II, there were something like 250,000 Jews living in Morocco in every social and economic strata. They were officials in government, they were doctors, lawyers, merchants, craftsmen, and even Jewish Berber tribes living in the far reaches of the Atlas and Reef Mountains. When Morocco declared its independence from the French in 1956, in fear of being oppressed by the Muslim king, they fled to France, Canada, Israel, and the United States. Today, there are maybe two, 3,000 Jews left, with the best estimates being the lower number. The Moroccan government is unique in the Arab world today because um, it specifies the unique role of its Jews in contributing to, the Moroccan, to Moroccan history for a period of over 2,000 years. It has devoted significant funds to the restoration of many Jewish monuments, synagogues, and cemeteries throughout the country. During this trip, I documented more than 15 synagogues and eight cemeteries with the intent to publish another book. So these are some representative images as there are literally thousands for me to sift through and to choose from. Stay tuned, I haven't really touched them. Enter the pandemic. So slide eight, please, the next slide. Um, the other side of my photographic schizophrenia is expressed in the desire to touch and alter standard photographic images in a more direct and intimate way. I miss the magic of the dark room that has been subsumed by the immediacy and prevalence of digital image making. Rather than take, again, with the quotes, photographs, I rather prefer these days to make them. This work is from a series called Daddy's Girl that is about my relationship with my father who died in November 2012 at the age of 95. Same father that put the uh, Kodak Browning in my hands. By creating these pieces, I found a way to process my grief at losing him by physically associating some mundane objects he kept close at hand every day of his life, his handkerchiefs, with the photographs he took of me as a young girl, along with words that may have remained unspoken between us at the time, but persist embroidered in memory just the same. Each piece portrays an emotionally charged moment in my early childhood when he was especially present and influential concerning my awareness of myself as a girl and at times when I may have subconsciously internalized his silent but palpable hopes, dreams, and expectations of me. Next slide, please. 
In these works, image, text, and handcraft were combined for me in a process I found to be new and exciting, as well as healing, moving beyond pure representation and reaching into my core identity as a woman, a daughter, an inheritor of Jewish values and family intentions, and as a maker of images. I was able to touch and feel my materials in a physical way, and as I worked, able to work through my grief and somewhat heal from losing my father. Since even at the ripe old age of 58, I felt raw and a bit without direction without him. Next slide, please. Also, at a point in my life where my own children were approaching adulthood, it was time to go back again and re-examine my own coming of age as I began moving towards another stage in life where further transitions would be inevitable. Okay, next slide. With the election in 2016, I was once again thrown off track. Only instead of mourning for my own personal losses, my attention turned to my worst fears about being an other in this country. Not just being a woman and a Jew, but also my adopted son's Hispanic heritage, my biological daughter's queerness, my partner's acquired American citizenship, and was the cancer that took the lives of several close friends at too early an age, really because of a terribly flawed and unhealthy environment. My personal circle of loved ones seemed a whirling microcosm of the larger injustices being perpetrated and amplified by this administration. My initial reaction was to join the marches and attend the meetings, sign the petitions, donate to the causes. I couldn't sleep, I overate, and I OD'd on social media and MSNBC. Late that fall, I began to walk as if my life depended on it. My iPhone came with me. I'm lucky to live near many nature reserves and walking trails, so I began to look around and take some pictures so that I could bring the solace of nature home with me, calm myself down, rest my jumpy nerves use the energy of walking outside and the workflow of photographing, editing, and printing in the most mechanical sense to pull myself out of this funk. Next slide. I took literally thousands of pictures, printed a few hundred as proofs, designated a notebook full of finals. These were entered and accepted at a bunch of local group shows that year and the next. As nice as that may seem, I felt like I wasn't being 100% true to myself or my work. And I was bothered by all the rejects, the photos that never made it into the finals, the ones filling my drawers that I couldn't bear to throw out because of the sheer waste of all that paper. What could I possibly do to redeem myself and my hoarding of all those paper prints? In anger and frustration, I started to rip them up into small pieces. Again, just the physical and mechanical action of tearing them up was a sort of therapy. It was almost like meditation, focusing on nothing in particular and just ripping and tearing away. Okay, next slide, please. You could see this is my flat file. This is where I put all of the pieces that I ripped up. <laughs> There's an origin story in Jewish mysticism, uh, the Kabbalah, that goes something like this. When God created the universe, he also placed the best part of himself as sparks of light into a collection of earthenware jars to be kept on earth as a reminder of his presence. But when Adam and Eve ate from the tree of knowledge and disrupted the good order of things, the jar shattered and God's sparks were scattered to the far corners of the world. Yet all was not lost. If we move through our lives and perform acts of kindness, those sparks will be gathered back together again and the world will be healed from its troubles. These small acts of kindness are called tikkun olam or translated into English, repairing the world. 
It occurred to me that I could perform my own small act of tikkun olam if only I could put these pieces back together again and create something new and meaningful out of them and in so doing, mitigate my potential and problematic contribution to landfill, saving the planet, or at least redeem one small part of our fragile environment. Next slide. So what better way to go about collecting the sparks than to get some golden thread and sew the pieces that I had ripped apart back together again. Okay, you can go to the next slide. This is an ongoing project that upon completion uh, will have uh, 12 pieces that I plan for the 12 months of the year presented in four groups of three pieces, concepted and organized according to the four seasons. So, so far, I've got all of the autumn and winter pieces finished. So that's six out of the 12. Okay, I, uh, before I go back to the piece I have in the show and talk about cyanotype, um, should we pause now and see if there's any questions or should I just continue to the end, Jessica? Sure, we can, we can take a pause for questions. Does anybody have one? Go ahead and unmute yourself and ask if you do. Or you can put it in the chat and we'll read it. All right, I think we're good to carry on. Okie dokie. All right, so let's go to the next slide. Okay, coming back, this is the piece that I have in the show. Um, it's a detail from a larger piece that I created in March using the cyanotype process. Cyanotype is, as I said at the beginning, a historical photographic process that was invented in 1842 by the British scientist Sir John Herschel. It involves combining two chemicals, potassium ferrocyanide and ferric ammonium citrate to create an emulsion that is sensitive to UV rays, like those of the sun. All right, next. Classic cyanotype is exposed in the sun using objects or a photographic negative. These are placed on a substrate, usually high quality watercolor paper or cotton cloth to create an image. The piece is then simply washed in plain water. Where the objects obstructed the light, the emulsion did not get exposed and when washed away, it leaves the original white color of the original substrate kind of, you know, it's a photogram. Where UV light interacted with the emulsion, it turns this intoxicating shade of Prussian blue. As you can see from this piece, I'm still using smaller units put together to create a larger hull. Only here the intention was to create something unified through the objects and not pieced together after the fact. There were several stalks of weeds and wildflowers laid across the cotton squares, extending the full length of the piece. When laid on its side, it reminded me of the wide expanse of the night sky and the recognizable Queen Anne's lace and grasses became abstracted, more open to the viewer's interpretation. Hence the name across the universe. Okay, we can go to the next slide. Cyanotype is something that lots of fine art photography students experiment with in school. I did too, and I always wanted to come back and explore it again. Its traditional history connects it to the natural world as its first practitioners use cyanotype to record botanical specimens in the name of science. We're familiar with it as the architectural blueprint that was that industry's primary tool for design until the advent of computers and digital 3D imaging. For me, looking for ways to connect the two very disparate sides of my photography practice, the realistic documentary taking side of image making and the abstract emotional making side has become the next challenge. And being confined to my home and immediate neighborhood during quarantine, cyanotype seemed to be the way to go. I was looking to transform the plants and natural places that I was recording with my camera 
into something new and magical. Next slide, please. This piece was my first attempt at combining a digital photograph with cyanotype. I first printed a sepia tone digital image out on my inkjet printer on a piece of rice paper made for digital prints. Next, I coated the surface with cyanotype emulsion while leaving some trails of the brush strokes. I also did something to break the rules. Instead of waiting until the emulsion had dried fully, I placed some botanical specimens on the wet surface and sprinkled some table salt. I put this out into the sun for about a half hour. When I rinsed it off, the table salt had made these fantastic marks around the image, and I was delighted. Next slide, please. Next, I tried going bigger and adding two more components. Turmeric powder, which leaves a trace of yellow and gold, and diluted white vinegar spray, which renders the cyanotype a much darker shade of blue, almost midnight blue. Next slide. I used a photograph detail from the original cyanotype that you just saw in the previous image, in the previous slide, to make this piece for my local artist collective holiday show. Uh, we were given the task um, and requirement to use the same 12 by 12 inch size wooden panel and to make an image using our own medium of choice. So what I did is I took a piece of that other cyanotype and I made a reproduction, printed it out 12 by 12 inches and I added gold stitching both by hand and by machine. Uh, you can't see the sides, but they're also painted with a gold um, sparkly acrylic paint. Okay, next slide. When COVID hit hard in March, I received word that my very first ever artist residency that was due to start this coming October at the Weir Farm National Preserve was going to be postponed indefinitely. I was devastated. At the same time, it looked as though my day job as a freelance designer in digital marketing was not going to get much action during the lockdown. So I decided to follow what I had proposed to do during the residency, uh, focusing on materials and process to see how far I could stretch the cyanotype process. I was most intent to experiment freely in order to arrive at creating my own visual vocabulary that would be distinctly different from anyone else that engaged with this medium. I set myself the goal of breaking out of its strict blue and white language and to make the process my own. What you're seeing on this slide is how I document each step of my process, because in some respects, it is almost more important right now than the end results. Here to the left, you see the branches of eucalyptus leaves in place on top of the wet cyanotype emulsion on paper at a point where it had already been in the sun for a few hours. The middle image shows what results once the acrylic sandwich and the botanicals uh, were removed and the piece had been given a single rinse in regular tap water. The image on the right is a detail that I took with a camera from the upper left corner of the larger work and that ended up being made into my final print. I've been greatly challenged by the way the prints look and the way they change during these various stages. Once they're completely dry, they often turn dark and muddy and they don't look anything like the works in progress, which are absolutely magical. So this has been, you know, really my big challenge with this body of work. Um, next slide. Um, so the next group of images and really kind of like the crux of what I wanted to show you this evening uh, are all pieces that have completed during uh, COVID quarantine at home. Uh, I can pace through them slowly and you can ask questions as we go. And at the end of the series, there are a few pieces that have retained their magical aura, even once the rinse and dry process is complete. 
I think that that's due to a combination of both learning how to better control the materials and exposure, but also to a greater degree due to my having started experimenting with different types of paper. Uh, just like in classic photography and printmaking, the choice of paper goes a long way in determining the final aesthetic attributes of a work. So let's take a look. Um, so the next five images, um, you know, we don't have to go through them quickly, but, uh, you know, they really um, surprised and delighted me when I you know, removed the flowers and plants and weeds and uh, gave them a short rinse. Sometimes I didn't give them a rinse at all. Um, and this is what resulted. And also, you know, I experiment with how I'm covering the paper. So sometimes I cover the paper edge to edge, but in these immediate images that you're looking at, I actually uh, love leaving the traces of the brushwork. I think you could go to the next one. This is unusual. This piece, I actually added um, some watercolor pigment that I bought in a market in, uh, in Morocco. So it's very interesting. I, you know, it's not an oil paint, it's a water-based paint, which means that when I put it on top or with my cyanotype emulsion, which is also water-based, and on a piece of watercolor paper, it sinks into the paper, and that's how I got these fantastic colors. Okay, next, please. So this is a piece that um, just had the uh, glass removed, and the, uh, in this case, they were forsythia branches um, as they were blooming in late March, early April, they were removed. And this had not been washed yet. The piece that I have in my drawers actually turned all blue. So the rust color went away after I washed it in water, which is a shame. I kind of like this um, complexity of color that you see here. Okay, next please. So this is um, sage, and I actually, I did four of these, not showing all of them, but I, I did like a homage to Simon and Garfunkel, parsley, sage, rosemary, and thyme, and this is the sage piece. Okay, next please. Um, this one totally surprised me. Um, often when uh, making these so-called wet cyanotypes, uh, I leave them in the sun for a very long time, sometimes even overnight. And really what happens is uh, the cyanotype solarizes. Uh, and that's what you're seeing here. So the gray is actually cyanotype that reversed in on top of itself and, and solarized to create this kind of silver color. Okay, next. All right, so the next two pieces uh, I printed edge to edge. Uh, I, I put this, the uh, cyanotype emulsion edge to edge and they were printed on a different kind of paper that I've been reading in all of the online groups that I subscribe to. Um, they're printed on Hanamule Platinum Rag, which is a paper that many, many people that engage in alternative photographic processes just love, uh, especially um, Platinum Palladium, because it has a very rich tonality and um, kind of a tonal scale and it has the ability to bring out detail and color. 
Um, the next slide, please. So this, I, I'm actually showing you some of my process. This is one of uh, the first attempts at making a purely cyanotype uh, double exposure. So what you see across the top right was um, I had made a blue image, just a blue and white classical um, cyanotype image without any of the other processes and I rinsed it in water and I got that blue and white image. Then all the way over to the extreme right, I immersed the, the very dark blue image into a bath of um, washing soda, like just regular, you know, it's arm and hammer washing powder. And what that does is it bleaches out the blue. Now, some people continue by toning uh, the bleached out image in tea or coffee or wine or other kinds of liquid that uh, change the color. But what I was interested in doing was getting some kind of a double exposure uh, feeling with both the gold color and the blue. And yellow and blue, as we know, renders green. So the large image, which is the final piece all the way over on the left-hand side, um, was that gold image that I covered again with just a pure uh, cyanotype emulsion left out in the sun for about 30 minutes and then I washed it off in water. <laughs> and that's what, what I got. So it kind of, you know, gave me a whole new uh, color experience. Okay, next slide. So um, this is um, a photo of a cyanotype that I made on a very large piece of paper. And these are beautiful papers that are made out of recycled materials in India. And I went back to a classic wet cyanotype on this handmade paper, it's watercolor paper, with um, very large leaves that grow on my house plants, um, covered with soap bubbles and my usual turmeric powder, which is the brown and yellow that you see there, table salt making the um, little white kinds of dots and diluted uh, vinegar, which makes those really dark blue areas. Okay, next. So here I am going back to um, images that I'm printing now on um, the Hanamil paper, the Indian recycled paper. And my next plan is to take those family images and to start a body of work that combine uh, both the um, old photographs with this new process that I've been exploring that is almost painterly uh, with both botanicals and possibly other kinds of images. Um, one can make very large negatives in this process and expose the cyanotypes like you would um, under an enlarger only using either a UV light uh, or the sun itself to make uh, actual representative photographic images. And that's kind of what's next for me. So um, that's it. That's where I am right now. And I would so love to answer any questions that you might have. We had a question in the chat from Trish. Um, how are you going to display 12 months? 
oh, well, that would have to be in a gallery space that has four walls. The way I picture it is a continuum around four walls. But then again, you know, up to any curator that would like to take that work. Um, individual pieces from the project were in several group shows, but I kind of feel that the meaning is, is lost um, when they're shown individually. I have a, I have a question. Can you hear me? I can. Oh, thank you. Um, I've actually had some trouble uh, seeing the combination of your work with your voice, but I did because something was happening with my Zoom, but I, I stayed and uh, like I heard everything that uh, you're, you said, your story. And first of all, I want to say I really enjoyed hearing your story and how you've Transform so many different uh, parts of your life. Um, I just uh, thought that was really wonderful. Uh, uh, and also, I wanted to let you know that I really liked the piece, A Walk at Twilight. I thought that that was an outstanding piece. And um, I, I wanted to ask you about the type of powder pigments you used mm -hmm. and the and the experimentation that you did to get the added colors mm -hmm. uh, because I noticed that you just put uh, powder pigments so that's one question and the other one kind of with it is when you uh, work with soap bubbles uh, what is your technique in generating the bubbles and uh, what is the process like when you apply the bubbles onto the surface yep. and do you let them dissolve? Just, just a little bit more detail. Right. Okay, sure. Yeah. So first about the pigment. So the powder. So if you can picture in your mind um, pulverized chalk, that's pretty yeah. much what they look like and what they feel like. It feels like chalk and I wouldn't be surprised if that's how they're made, because there's a lot of chalk and phosphates in Morocco. So I wouldn't be surprised if that's how they were made. Um, and when I bought them, I bought a set of 20 little jars that are about this big. So you don't need a whole lot. And what the, um, the merchant in the shop where I bought them told me is you just mix it with water. So since I'm covering a piece of paper with an emulsion that's wet, it's a wet emulsion, and I'm also spraying from a spray bottle this diluted vinegar and water, it's a very wet surface that I'm dealing with. I put the botanicals down first. And then I see where they are and where I might want to use the color to trace an outline of a leaf or a flower or, or whatever's there. And I basically just take a pinch of the powder and, and sprinkle it. Um, the turmeric powder works in the same way. It just happens to be a natural dye. It's yellow. And the turmeric, um, comes in a regular spice jar that you get in the supermarket with the, all those holes punched. So I just shake it and you know, they come yeah. out. Um, I've used some recycled uh, spice jars for the, for the color pigments as well, so that I could shake them and, and get a more even kind of spread around. But it's all kind of, chancy and surprise and not highly controlled. There are people that work with cyanotype with the negatives and with other alternative processes and they're really into like a very controlled exposure time and a very controlled sense of how they make their negatives. But I'm kind of a wild west gal, you know, I just yeah. kind of 
slather it on and see what happens. So you're actually really uh, like drawing with the pigments when yeah. you sprinkle them. Mm -hmm. you're, you, you're using the pigments as a line around the objects. Right. Is, is that, is that, yes. that's, yes. that's what it sounds like. Right, and you know, I've always been frustrated that I couldn't draw. Like I can't draw from life. Uh, I know there are people that subscribe that everybody can draw but I never had the patience, you know, uh, photography was the right thing for me. Click a button and, you, and you, you have a piece of work. So now I'm trying to slow down and I'm trying to be a little bit more intentional uh, and I'm trying to incorporate just physical acts of working with materials and touching the materials because I miss the dark room. And so do you... Yeah, go ahead. So do you make your large negatives or do you send them out? I'm making what I'm starting to do. I haven't really made a lot yet, but I have uh, an Epson printer and the largest that I can print on there is 22 by 17. So the first negatives that I've been making are eight, eight and a half by 11 or eight by 10. You know, they're just, and they're transparencies. They're a special kind of transparencies that you can buy that print out very nicely on an inkjet printer. Um, I just received, with the latest order of materials to my house, um, 13 by 19 transparencies. So I'll be able to make large, larger negatives. But I'm not so sure that I, again, that I want to stick to the idea of four corners. Like I like to pieces and, you know, put them in different places. I'm not, I'm not sure that I, that I want to stick to um, what's really been considered a traditional photograph. Thank Can you I so add much. a little tip about film? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, it, this is Trish. I've done a lot of cyanotype and I'm, I haven't done the outdoors one. I do one on my light exposure unit. I print on an Epson archival inkjet print. I really found the quality of the film is really important to get the full range from white to dark. And I just put in what I find the, uh, the best film because I tested a whole bunch. Mm -hmm. It's still absolute clear. It's what um, they're using for solar plates and so on. It That's holds, a, it's yeah. still S-I-H-L, absolute clear. Ah. I think it's sold by Freedom Paper, much cheaper than Amazon. Although I think Amazon has it, but you'll find Freedom Paper has free shipping and it's cheaper. And you'll get a roll of either 24 inches or 36 inches mm -hmm. for two or $300. And it, you can cut it to any size. Oh, very so good. it's wow. much, much more affordable than buying something that's a certain size and then finding you want it longer. But the, the best thing about this film is that it's, um, it's very clear. There's no grunge on the film. So the light goes right through it and it holds a huge amount of inkjet ink so wow. it actually makes a very dense black right because some people that i've read they actually make two negatives and stack them on top of one another yeah you know, no that that that's only if you have a crappy inkjet printer yeah. um, no, you'll I actually do better that. by adding a uh, hundred percent black and thirty percent uh and thirty percent yellow so if you I can send you the, there's a PDF online from one of the university professors who did a lot of research on the density. And I okay. found that also gave me a much blacker black. And in the Epson advanced printing settings, you can mm -hmm. actually say print uh, with 30% yellow, 100% black. Nice. And it well, makes wow. a really dense black. Yeah. Thanks for that share. Yeah. yeah it's, the, it's the old printer trick. When, whenever you go to a real printer and you say I want a really dense black on this white paper they're, they're not printing just black they're printing 100% black 30% yellow 30% blue and 30% um, and 30% magenta so th that's called a rich full black and so when I read that advice I went oh that makes so much sense from being from the you know from the printing world doing you know books and magazines you 100% black is not dense uh, you need to add a little bit of color and, but, uh, you know, inkjet ink is expensive. So they worked out that you really don't need to add a full CNYK, full rich black and eat up all your ink, just a little bit of yellow 
uh, is just enough to make the black blacker. So you have really clear film and really black black, and you get the full range. That's I did awesome. gradients, I did little squares, I did all the testing on cotton, on papers, and on silk. And uh, dialed in my exposure unit to the second, so I could actually print a photograph uh, really nicely wow. onto any kind of fabric. So, yeah, really, it really works to spend uh, half of your time researching and the other half printing. <laughs> because other, otherwise, you just waste a lot of time and materials. Just do a lot of gradients if you really want to dial in your materials. But as soon as you change one thing, you change the paper or you go from silk to cotton, you have to change, you have to reset your base exposure and then figure out what the exposure is for this particular thing. But the, the less, the fewer things you change, the easier it is. So start with the film, start with uh, the cyanotype material, like don't change vendors. I went to Bostick and Sullivan in Santa Fe and I used their cyanotype, totally different exposure time. I'm like, why is this not working? Like last year it worked fine. I realized, oh, I changed something. So it's just something to think about. But I'm, I wanted to ask you a question for me. I was really intrigued by your vinegar um, and all these salt. And I've, I've heard about adding bubbles and so, but are you like spraying the vinegar? Or are you dropping it or? I put it in a spray bottle. A spray <laughs> bottle. So it gives you little fine yeah. sprays. Yeah, 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 I like that. I love that idea. And you know, uh, there was a question before from Sadie about the bubbles. Yes. So it's basically um, Dial or um, Dawn or I've even used Trader Joe vegetable wash, any kind of, you know, kind of clear soap and I put it in a bowl. I let the faucet run and then I take my hand and I just beat it like I'm beating an egg and I get really big bubbles. And I found that if I do it in a metal bowl, I get better bubbles. Huh. And if I do it in a deeper bowl, I get better bubbles. And then you just scoop up, not without the water, you just scoop up the top with the, with the bubbles and throw them wherever you want them to go. Some yeah. people cover the whole thing. Some people just cover parts of it. Uh, obviously when I'm doing the brush mark thing and I'm not covering the entire paper corner to corner, um, they, once I put the glass on top or the uh, sheet of acetate, because you need a contact print, whether you're using botanicals or whether you're using a negative, yeah. um, and it squeezes the bubbles, you know, so they're not kind of glommed on top, they're yeah. pushed down. And they also, because of the soap, uh, reacts a little bit with the cyanotype uh, emulsion solution. And sometimes it kind of bleaches out the area, but a little bit of the cyanotype stays. And if it's mixed with turmeric powder, do you get the bubbles? I don't know, you know, Jessica, whether you want to go back to the piece that um, I have in the show. But if you do that and blow it up very large, you'll be able to see really closely um, how the bubbles came out in that piece. And also, uh, I, I believe that that piece, instead of using glass or together with the glass, I believe that I wrapped it in cyan, you know, in cyan wrap. Oh, thank you. Plastic wrap. Can you make your, your screen larger so that the image just blows up really big? Or are you? Well, it's a PowerPoint. Right, but if you hit yeah. Command Plus, it should, it, it should get big on the screen. Or if people are using, um, you know, the full, the full screen, then it'll look bigger. Yeah, it's fine. We can. I think. Yeah. We can. Okay. Yeah, really interesting. Yeah. I would have asked. I would have asked Trisha. Trisha, with yeah. with the um, the transparencies that you were talking about earlier, have you done any experimentation with the polymer print using those uh, films? Yes. That's yes. where exactly. Is that, I've done it, solar plates. Um, 
you this sale, so Absolute quick. Clear, came from um, taking workshops with people who do solar plates and not finding that you could get full black to white. So um, I, a lot of the film that they sell at office stores has a lot of grain on it. Oh, that's lovely. Thank you, Jessica. That's beautiful. Yeah. yeah so you can see where the bubbles are. Yeah. And anything that's kind of gold is where there's a trace of turmeric powder. Um, and then if you kind of move it uh, so that we can see the right side of the print, you'll see kind of striations with the bubbles and it's mm -hmm. where the, um, the plastic wrap kind of <laughs> went around the piece and, and caused, you know, like different amounts of pressure on, mm -hmm. you know, on the print. Yeah. Beautiful. It is. Yeah. It looks like the bubbles create a texture, yes. like like the a, a texture you would see at the sea or in the on the ground, it, and it looks very organic too. Yeah. Yeah, it's beautiful. I'll have to do this outside the next time. I tried it on my exposure unit and made a huge mess. I yeah. had to clean it all <laughs> up. So I said, oh, I'll do that next time outside. <laughs> so. so I will mention, by the way, uh, Sadie, first, I love your piece that's in the show. Oh, the thank one you. That you just called Untitled. I thought that was absolutely gorgeous. And then the other thing is, although the 24 inch roll of film is a little cheaper, you waste a lot less for the 36 because an Epson printer is 17 inches wide. If you have that 17 inch wide print, when you have 24 inches, it just doesn't work. You end up with lots of little skinny strips that you don't right. use. Right. Uh, right. So the 36, you can cut in half and you waste a lot less film. So, Thank you. Although those little strips are useful for doing tests. Yeah. But you know, there's only so many tests you need to do if you're doing, uh, you know, big prints. So. Any more questions? All right, well, thank you so much, Roma. Thank you everybody oh, thank for coming. You. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you so much, Jessica. I guess we'll see you next week, Roma. <laughs> yes, yep, we have um, a new show opening next week, which we will have also artist talks, probably um, more people in a shorter format. So, um, let us know if you want to get sent that link. We'll do a new link, but it's also on our Facebook page. Um, I don't have the show information in front of me. Hey, it's <laughs> our mark making. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, I, I'm in it with another bunch, including Dan Weldon, from, who does solar plates. So if you're interested in those and a lot of Albuquerque artists, it's organized by Christine Herman. And and I did I did put up the link to be informed of future online opening receptions and talks. So if you sign up at that link, I'll definitely, you'll get the link for, for the next talk. Um, great, everybody. Well, we will um, get the, this talk up on YouTube and we'll have all the others there as well. And um, I hope you guys enjoy the rest of your weekend and, and have a great day. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thanks, Thanks Jessica. Steve. Thanks. 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 Thanks for, for everybody. Very interesting. Thanks, Trish. Bye, Bye Barbara. <laughs>